Shabbat Shalom, people of God. We want to thank you here at Caritas Hope for joining us yet again as we walk through the Word of God. And today we are going to be expounding upon Mark 8. So if you are uh, have some time, please get your Bibles out. We are going to be coming out of the New Living Translation of the Word of God. But before we dive into all of God and his goodness, I want to ask, have you joined our Facebook page yet? We have a ton of word of inspiration coming out every single day of the week. And I want to encourage you to definitely become our friend on Facebook at Tiz Hope, T-I-Z-H-O-P-E. You're going to see a little rock there, and it's going to have the word hope in it. That's how you know you're in the right place, because we have our question of the day that comes out monthly on top of the daily word that's brought to you by one of our anointed ministers, Kershana Bullard, and she is going to be answering questions that we have about the word of God, but also sending us back to the word of God where we will be encouraged and strengthened by the word of God. Amen. So, before we get started, let us go into prayer. Because God is good and he is worthy of our praise this day and every day of our life. He is a sustainer. So, Father God, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus, thanking you, oh God, for all that you are. We thank you, great God, for being Lord over our life. We thank you for being the God that brought us here to this day. We thank you that we are here to fellowship with one another, oh God, in your word to bring clarity to what it is that thus saith the Lord. Father God, bring your word forward clearly. Father God, make it so simple that a child could understand your word. Father God, release understanding today right now, God. Remove all distractions in this hour, Father God, that will keep us from hearing and obtaining your word, Father God, but in the midst of your word being brought forth, Father God, write it in our hearts that we could always go back to it at a later time. Father, we thank you for all that you are, great God that you are, in Yahweh's name, amen. Amen. So we are going to be coming out of the New Living Translation of the Word of God. And this word is so good, I can't keep it to myself. Amen. Hey, come on and dive and walk with us as we walk in the Word. Hallelujah. And this is where Jesus feeds 4,000. This is Mark 8, New Living Translation, verse 1. About this time, another large crowd gathered. And the people ran out of food again. Jesus called to the disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way. For some of them have come a long distance. His disciples replied, how are you supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. Then he took seven loaves, thanked God for them, and broke them into pieces. He gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found. Two, excuse me, a few f small fish were found too. So Jesus also blessed these and told the disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up seven large baskets and of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day. And Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. Immediately after this, he got into the boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him. They demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. 
When he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, I will not give this generation any such sign. So he got back into the boat and left them. He crossed to the other side of the lake, but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned to watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this time, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? I, When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterwards? 12, they said. Don't you understand yet, he asked them. When I fed 4,000 with seven loaves, how many baskets were left over did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet, he asked them. When they arrived to Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then, spitting on the man's eyes, he said to his he laid his hands on him and asked, "Can you see anything now?" The man looked around. "Yes," he said. "I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around." Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. He, his sight was completely restored, and he could even see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the village near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do you say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say that you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the son of man, which was him, may suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around at his disciples and then began to reprimand Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my teaching in this message, in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed at that person when he returns to the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen.
Amen. So now we see here in Mark 8, just as we've seen in Mark 6, how Jesus fed a multitude of people. Now in Mark 6, Jesus fed 5,000. And this time, Jesus fed the 4,000. Now after, soon after, Jesus had fed these 4,000, he has then begun and got approached by some Pharisees who was demanding him to do something miraculous. Now, if you haven't been walking through the word with us lately, um, please go back and um, dive into our teachings. As you can see that Jesus were doing so many miraculous things that was happening on his journey. He was healing the blind. He was healing the lame. He was healing the leper. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. He healed the the, the, the child with the disease. He healed so many people. And the thing is, some of these miracles took place in front of the Pharisees, but even if they weren't there, because I can't pinpoint and exactly say that all the Pharisees that was asking him from a miraculous sign to prove his authority were evidently there when he did some of these miracles but we can see how large crowds were drawn to jesus and people even when he fed the four thousand had came from long distances that he was worried that if they even traveled to go home that they will faint on their trip so they knew by word of mouth that Jesus was performing so many miracles, yet they were still asking him to perform yet another for them to prove his authority. My goodness. But even him, them, the Pharisees asking him to prove his authority, it was necessary for Jesus to warn his disciples to not be taken in by the yeast of the Pharisees and King Herod. And that more so look like as they were arguing about bread. Now his disciples have been with him ever since he chose them and began his ministry of sharing the good news of God and the kingdom of heaven. So he's seeing his disciples arguing about bread like he hasn't read, like in, in Mark 6, he hasn't fed the 5,000. And when I say 5,000, it was 5,000 men. There were also their children and women that were there too. So more than 5,000 people were fed. Now they see that he was able to feed 4,000 with loaves of bread and some small fish that he had found. So God, Jesus has literally shown them that I can make a multitude out of a minute thing. And he warned his disciples because even though they were present in the midst of these miracles of him making five loaves of bread, seven loaves of bread, not only did they feed a multitude, but they were able to have leftovers. And yet the people that seen this thing very happen, the same people that pushed this bread out and gave this bread out to the people were still arguing about them not having any bread. Now he was warning them to be mindful of the yeast of the Pharisees. Now we are in a new day and age. We're in 2022 now. So not too many people are making bread from scratch, but what yeast does is what yeast amplifies the bread because if you put flour and dough together you're only going to have a flat piece of bread but what happens when you add yeast and you only need a little bit when you add yeast it actually amplifies the bread so what he was warning his disciples was the same questions that the pharisees were asking show us a miracle to prove your authority he was saying don't let their thought processes don't let their ways get into you and magnify inside of you that you are arguing about not having bread when we clearly fed four and five thousand people with just little you think i can't make things happen out of nothing you still don't see that i can make the greatest thing out of something so small you've been walking with me you've been with me how can you still argue with one another about not having bread when i I am the bread of life. I am the one that can reach out to the Father and can make the impossible possible. So that's what happened. And so he's telling them, don't be like them. Don't be like them. I can make more with this. I truly can. 
So not only was he he dealing with that, and, and I love the fact that when the, when the uh, Pharisees came and questioned him about him doing a miracle, he just got in his boat and left. Listen, when people are still questioning what it is that you're putting out and you know you are doing it through the Spirit of God, dust your feet off and keep going on about your way. Because Jesus Christ didn't have time to keep proving things to them. He can tell by the crowd that what he was doing was legit. I know that some of the other Pharisees at, were eyewitnesses to some of the miracles. So he said, I don't even have time to try to prove anything to you. He got on his boat and he went right across the lake and he had some other business to take care of. So while he was warning his disciples, to not even fall into that mindset. Don't need more when I'm already showing you who I am and my authority. So he even asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they said, they said, you're the prophet Elijah. You, you're the reincarnation of Elijah. You are no, another prophet. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said that you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. And he told them to keep that. Don't tell nobody about it. Because you know, you know exactly, you know exactly who I am. And Jesus, now he's talking to his disciples about his death and what his life looks going to look like, how he's going to be crucified, how he's going to be I'm, I'm adding more words to it, but how he's going to be ridiculed, how he's going to look crazy, how he's going to be doubted. And he's telling his disciples, when you follow me, expect the same exact thing. But Peter, he couldn't even handle the fact that Jesus was talking about his death. Because, I mean, I, from a human standpoint, I understand where Peter was coming from. But from a godly standpoint, I understand where Jesus was coming from. So let's make it make sense. So Peter's like, listen, we've walked away from our lives. We've walked away from what we know. We've walked away from our families. We've walked away from our livelihood. And we've been following you for three whole years, dedicated and walking with you. And now you're telling us you're just about to up and leave? Nah, nah, no, no. But, but, and, and I understand why Jesus say, get thee behind me, Satan, because what, what Peter was doing even in his human nature, he was he was basically trying, he went against the purpose of God. Come on, somebody. Jesus had a purpose. His purpose was to come and be the sacrifice for your life and for mine and for all of those who are willing to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So he's saying, you're telling me, no, I'm not going to die as if my father's plan is not the right plan, as if what God ordained my purpose here is void. It doesn't like that isn't correct. Get behind me because what Jesus will always say that his father's will will be done. So, so Peter was looking at it like, listen, we about to lose my friend. I'm about to lose my homeboy. You know, I done gave up everything. I gave up my job and everything to follow you. And now you're telling me that you're leaving me. I get it. I get it. But Jesus' purpose wasn't to walk with them forever. Jesus was came to be the sacrifice so that we could be back into relationship with the divine God, the holy God. So he's telling them, you going to follow me? Ridicule is going to be at your door. If you're going to follow me, you're going to be crucified. If you're going to follow me, you got to die to your ways. Your ways. Because it's not your will. It's the Father's will that should be done for your life. And how do you know what's the will of God? Read his word. Read God's word. His word will reveal to you who you are. And when you begin to go through these things that Jesus was experiencing and what Jesus was telling his disciples about, that's confirmation that you're on the right track because he's letting us know that comes with this walk. And as ugly as it may sound, 
your ways must die also. Because we are called to, 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 to live in this human experience. But we, we're, we're kingdom citizens. We're citizens of heaven. We're spiritual beings having an earthly experience. We, we are. So when Jesus is telling them all that they will have to endure to follow him, because losing your life, it can look scary. It really can. What you know, what you're used to, what you're comfortable with. It's easy to do what you know. But that must die. Because when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God makes you new. He, he, he gives you a new mind. He gives you a new heart. But some of us tr struggle with that because we don't know how to allow ourselves to die and let the Lord live inside of us. And it's extremely hard to do that when you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you to be your guide, to be your comforter. Because all of these things that Jesus said that he's going through, it's gonna happen for you. It is. But the great thing about it is you don't have to do any of this by yourself. When you have that Holy Spirit inside of you, it'll give you a peace in the middle of your storm. It'll give you strength. It'll give you power. It will give you self-discipline. The word of God is a spiritual word. And the spirit is our guide. So you have to feed your spirit in order for it to develop, in order for you to become aligned with God and his word. So if you've been fighting and living all by yourself, let that Holy Spirit in because God knocks. He doesn't force his way in at all. The choice is yours. The choice is truly yours. But for me, I can say it will be the best decision you have ever made in your life. It will be. Because God will begin, begin to bring people who believe to you, people to pour into you, to you. He's going he's gonna to give you what you need because God will equip everyone that he calls. So don't worry about doing it by yourself, especially after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you're ready, and if you're ready today, if you're ready to say yes, to God, yes, to his love, yes, to his forgiveness, yes, to his strength, yes, to his power, please repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus, thanking you, Lord, for your son, who came and died for my sins. I believe he is truly the son of God. So Lord, I invite the Holy Spirit into my life in exchange for my life. Forgive me for my sins, God and create in me a clean heart. Strengthen me for this journey and keep me along the way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Amen. Amen. Not only am I rejoicing as your sister, the angels in heaven are rejoicing for your soul today because you just literally pulled yourself out of a fire and into the grace of God, into relationship with God, into connection with God. We thank you here at Claritis Home Ministries. If you have any questions about this wall, what it looks like, how to get on track, how to stay faithful, how to stay grounded, how to stay rooted, reach out to us. Reach out to us and let us be your GPS back to home. Let us be your GPS into a relationship with the Most High God. I thank you so much for joining me this morning. I am your sister, Pastor T. I thank you for joining us. I love you. But my slogan is God will love you more than I could ever. I thank you for joining us and have yourselves an amazing day.